Good evening, everybody. My name is Corey Byron. I am the Director of Guidance at Hanover High School. Um, we're going to do introductions of everybody in just a minute. Um, Thank you so much for joining us. We're really happy to have so many high schools participating from all over the South Shore. Um, tonight's program will run in about an hour, hour and a half, um, depending on how many questions we have. It's going to be a Q&A format um, after a brief introduction and summary from each of the colleges. Um, we would love for you to type your questions in the Q&A box in, um, in the webinar. And once your questions are loaded, um, one of the counselors from Hanover will ask the um, panelists. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get to all of your questions. Um, if you don't, if we are unable to get to your questions, um, you can certainly email your uh, guidance counselor at your high school or one of us at Hanover High School, um, and we can find out the answers for you. Um, I'm just going to start with introductions. Can we start with the Hanover High team? Um, Janelle, do you want to? Hi, I'm Janelle Cost. I'm one of the guidance counselors at Hanover High School. Hi, I'm Julie O'Neill. I am another guidance counselor at Hanover High School. Um, and the colleges that we have with us tonight, I'm going to let them um, introduce themselves and give a brief summary of their school. We have uh, Providence College, Bridgewater State, Bates College, UMass Amherst, UC San Diego, and Quinnipiac. I got everybody right. Did I leave anybody up? Okay. Um, so, I, you know, we'll get started. I don't know if, um, Bates, you wanted to start with a brief summary in, of, of your school. Um, and again, if you have questions, um, attendees, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Great. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Daryl Uy. I'm the Director of Admissions here at Bates College um, and really thankful for Hanover for having us and uh, glad to be here. So uh, Bates College is a small private liberal arts college located in Lewiston, Maine, which is about 40 minutes north of Portland, Maine. Um, and since our founding in 1855, uh, we've been recruiting and enrolling students regardless of race, religion, national origin, class and gender. Um, and it's this commitment to diversity, access, and inclusion that has really been the guiding principle in terms of everything we do moving forward as an institution. So it's the reason why we have no Greek life, so no fraternities or sororities. It's the reason why we only have one dining hall for the entire community to come together as one. And the reason why we went test optional in the admissions process over 35 years ago. Um, we don't claim to be perfect or utopia, but to this day, Bates continues to strive for equality and accessibility for all. Um, a few other things to note. Um, uh, community engagement is kind of a hallmark of the Bates education. Um, the Harvard Center for Community Partnerships is the college's main hub of all community engagement opportunities within Lewiston and our sister city of Auburn. Um, and we try to align their interests um, and their talents with sort of local organizations and local needs within Lewiston and Auburn. In addition, we have a very unique academic calendar called the 441 plan where students take four classes in the fall, four in the winter, and only one class during the month of May, which we call short-term. Um, and short-term classes are mostly on campus, but you can take a class, say, in theater um, in Budapest for all of short-term, or a biology course down in the Galapagos Islands, or an English class on Shakespeare in London, England. Um, so pretty amazing things you could do during short-term. Again, you're only taking one class, it's in May, all the winter main snow is gone, um, and you can really enjoy your time outdoors um, in the sun. So. And then the only other thing to mention is that um, about 1,850 students from nearly all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, and about 70 different countries, um, about 25% identify as black, indigenous, or people of color, 9% um, international, 12% first in their family to go to college, and then 100% of our students do a senior thesis across all 36 majors. We offer 25 minors and 75 concentrations as well economics, political science, environmental science, biology, and psychology are the top five most popular majors. 31 varsity teams and 100 clubs and organizations as well. Um, so I'm happy to answer more questions later on or throughout this session, um, but I'll leave it short and brief and pass it on to the next school. Thanks. Uh, if I remember the alphabet song correctly, I think uh, Bridgewater State might be next. So uh, good evening. My, uh, my name is Todd Audiatus. I'm the Associate Dean of Admission at Bridgewater State University. 
And uh, many of you may be familiar with us. We are your local regional public university, uh, located probably within easy driving distance to just about any community who is uh, in on our presentation tonight, but certainly Hanover. Um, so uh, if you don't know us especially well, we are a mid-sized public university. Uh, by mid-sized, I mean we have 8,000 full-time undergraduate students. That makes Bridgewater the largest state university in Massachusetts, of course, separate from the UMass system, although we are bigger than UMass Dartmouth, so we're a pretty good size. One of the advantages to being a, a mid-sized university is that you get access to all those amenities, resources, and opportunities that you get with 36 different majors and over 100 different areas of study. And it, it's big enough that it allows even local students to be able to come to our campus and sort of hit the reset button. You know, I mean, you can hang out with friends from Hanover High School or whichever high school you're attending currently, or you can find a new group of friends among the 8,000 full-time undergraduate students. So really it's sort of the best of both worlds in that sense. But as a mid-sized university, oftentimes we say that and students will conjure up visions of being, you know, one of a few hundred students in a large auditorium sized classroom. And that may be the case at some mid-sized universities. However, it's not going to be the case for you at Bridgewater. So to give you a sense, our average class size at Bridgewater is 22, 22. So if you understand averages, of course, it's range, right? But even still, we cap our class sizes at 40. So there are no large auditorium sized classrooms and you'll very quickly get down to that average of 22. In some cases, upper level classes, it's gonna be much smaller than that. So it's a small school feel where it matters the most in the classroom where you get individualized attention from your professors, which is really, it's the hallmark of who we are. It goes back to 1840 when we were a one room schoolhouse here in Bridgewater. We've grown a lot since then, but we haven't lost that aspect of our identity. It's important to us. And again, as a mid-sized university, lots of opportunities. I mean, if you want to commute to Bridgewater and you live locally, certainly an option for you. 60% of our students are commuters. It makes it a lot more affordable for our students. On the other hand, though, 40% of the number I threw out earlier means we got like 3,300 students living on campus in our 11 residence halls. And we can guarantee housing for the duration of your stay at Bridgewater. So if you do want that traditional living on campus experience, we absolutely offer that to students. And we also offer some extraordinary experiential learning opportunities, which is a fancy way of saying things like study abroad, undergraduate research, and internships. So study abroad, 30% of our students have some kind of international experience before they graduate from Bridgewater. For many of those students, it's the first time they've ever stepped foot on a plane. And we have 75 different study abroad programs in more than 35 different countries. Undergraduate research, extraordinarily popular at Bridgewater. You initiate your own independent academic research project with a faculty mentor. 1,700 students a year at Bridgewater do undergraduate research. It's like 20% of our student population. Popular program. How good is it this year? Bridgewater was ranked number one in the country for undergraduate research among master's granting institutions. Number one, great springboard for students who want to go on to graduate school or distinguish yourself when you go out into the job market. And internships, we start off as a teacher's college. You're all familiar with student teachers, right? So internships, same sort of thing. Getting real world experience is part of your education, except with internships, you can do it regardless of major. And before the COVID crisis hit, Bridgewater awarded out more than half a million dollars for our students to go out and do otherwise unpaid internships so they could get real world experience as part of the Bridgewater education. Again, it's part of our roots. So we'll have an opportunity to talk a lot about Bridgewater and what it means to be a smaller or mid-sized public institution as the night goes on. I'm excited to be here tonight and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank Mike, I think you're next. I wasn't Anderson. sure if we were going by the U, the A, the M. <laughs> I, you know what? I don't know. Well, you, you're welcome to go next. <laughs> I'm happy to do so. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's great to see such such a large turnout. I wish we could physically see all of you. That's one of the hardest parts of this experience is we all enjoy being usually on site where we get to interact and engage with all of you. But hopefully the at least the content tonight will be helpful. Uh, my name is Mike Drish. I'm the director of admissions at UMass Amherst. Um, most of you have probably heard of us. Um, UMass is the Commonwealth's flagship university. Um, we are a diverse, welcoming, supportive community of 22,000 undergraduates. So we represent that large public flagship category of university. Um, and you are fortunate to have not only UMass Amherst, but the UMass system here in Massachusetts, because you also, as you heard, we have uh, UMass Dartmouth, UMass Lowell, and UMass Boston, all in very different locations, 
different settings, different majors, different physical campus makeups, different types of students at each campus. So you have a wide range of choices. And then like Todd was saying, combine that with the state university system, a wide range of great choices here um, in Massachusetts. So definitely check them out because one of the tough parts of being a UMass or I'm sure like the same thing with Bridgewater State is people usually think they know us. You know, it's a familiar name. It's something that you know, you may know someone who went to like UMass Amherst, you may have family members who went here and they think they know UMass for better or worse. And sometimes UMass in 1991 is very different than UMass in 2001 than UMass here in 2021. We are an ever-changing, ever-evolving institution. And I say that because most public flagship universities are very similar where they're ever-changing, ever-evolving. And usually I would argue it's one of the best times to attend a university like UMass. It doesn't mean that someone who attended UMass 20, 30 years ago didn't get a great experience. But I think that especially our commitment to undergraduate education our commitment to academic excellence is second to none. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons we're ranked as one of the top public universities in the country. I mentioned that we're home to 22,000 undergraduate students. Um, a significant number of those students are the first in their family to attend um, college. They come from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, but we also, so you, you have this diverse student population that reflects the population of Massachusetts, students from every background and experience like people around the nation and around the world. But there are some ways that UMass defies some logic. Um, the first is Todd alluded to this with Bridgewater State as well. B believe it or not, Hollywood doesn't always get it right. That just because we're a big place, that somehow you're in massive large lectures where some professors just droning on and on on a stage. That's pretty limited at any college or university. But especially at UMass, we've made a concerted effort over the past five to 10 years to reduce class size. To, and if you come and check out the campus, you'll see there are a lot of new buildings. All of those new buildings have small classrooms where students are engaging in teams and projects with faculty, with their peers. And so our average class size out of the 4,000 courses offered to you in any given semester is about 40 students. So the vast majority of the student, the classes at UMass are much smaller than you might have expected. We also defy logic because as a large public university, we are an overwhelmingly residential campus. You're required to live on campus in your first year. So 100% of our first year students do. And we house over 16,000 of our students on campus in a typical year. Um, the nice thing about that is you have an incredible place to live. For five years in a row, we've also been ranked number one in the nation for dining. Not a reason to choose a college university, but knowing you're getting some of the best food um, is a little bit of that comfort when you're away from home. And then you're in Amherst, Massachusetts, which is a quintessential college town, um, has amazing cuisine options comparable to what you'd be used to in a major metropolitan area. Um, and again, part of that's because we draw students from every background and experience, and they go out and experience what Amherst has to offer, Northampton nearby. Um, and there are five colleges in this area, so that higher education commitment is alive and well. The final thing that that I would like to say about UMass is the other thing that you get with UMass is depth and breadth. One of the benefits of attending a large university is we have over 100 majors in 10 different schools and colleges. That's the biggest difference between a smaller university or college is that the reason we are a university is because we have 10 colleges or schools that make up UMass. And you can major in those, you can double major, you can choose different minor fields of study, and still graduate in four years. Over 80% of our students graduate in four years. That's one of the highest four-year graduation rates of any public university in the country. We're proud of that. We love you, but we want you in, out, and on your way in four years. And as you heard um, one of the earlier speakers allude to, that placement into the job market or undergraduate or professional school is all but assured. One thing that I'm so proud of at UMass is our class of 2020 had in most of our fields at or above the placement rate of the class of 2019. COVID did not slow that down. Part of that's because UMass has an alumni network of over 350,000 living alumni, which means a lot of companies and organizations are connected to UMass. They hire graduates. We have incredible students they want placed in those companies or organizations for internships and ultimately jobs. So the four years are an incredible experience and they lead to the next 40 years, they're going to be that great success in the job market and grad or professional school, whatever 
your end goal is both here in Massachusetts, around the nation, or possibly worldwide. Um, so looking forward to the questions tonight, um, but thanks. Uh, Taylor, do you want to go next from San Diego? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor. I am an admissions officer here with UC San Diego. Uh, UC San Diego is part of the University of California system. So the UC system has nine undergraduate campuses across the state. Um, so UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, those are all of our sister schools. Um, we are all a part of the same system, which means we do have quite a few commonalities. So all UCs require the same minimum admission criteria. They all are going to offer graduate pro programs, research opportunities. Um, we all have similar review process for our applications. However, we are all completely separate institutions. Uh, so UC San Diego, we are located at the very most southern part of the state, uh, San Diego. Um, very great place to go to school. We're located about two hours south of LA and just about 30 minutes north of the border of Mexico. San Diego's office obviously known for great weather. Um, it's like almost 80 degrees here right now. Um, in terms of our campus, we sit on just about 1200 acres of land and UC San Diego is located in La Jolla. So La Jolla is a suburban town located about uh, 20 minutes north of downtown San Diego. Um, Alicia Keys actually lives in La Jolla. She's done a couple music practices on our campus, which is pretty cool. I'm still waiting to run into her, hopefully. Uh, but again, we're on about 1,200 acres, so we are a pretty big campus. Um, we offer just over 140 different majors, um, spanning all different disciplines. We get most of our students pursuing programs in either the biological or social sciences. However, we do get the most applications for our engineering and our computer science programs. Um, our student population is right now just under 40,000. I think last time I checked, it was about 38,000. Um, about 20% of our incoming students every year come from out of state with about 15% of that, I'm sorry, 10% of that being about international, the other 10% coming from other states in the US. Um, so we are a big school, but one of the things that does make UC San Diego unique is our college system. Um, so our college system, the best way I always describe it, if any of you in the audience are Harry Potter fans, this is your chance to kind of live out your Harry Potter fantasy. But our campus is broken down into seven individual college communities. The thing that makes our colleges unique is that they actually are not tied to any particular major. So this means someone who is studying theater, engineering, political science, and psychology can all be within the same college. Um, so it's a really great way for you to get that interdisciplinary experience. We wanted to give students kind of that more liberal arts feel, even though you are at a large research institution. So when you apply to the university, you'll rank your colleges. And then if you are admitted, we do our best to get you within your top three choices. Um, but our campus is, again, very large, a lot of great opportunities. We have over 600 student organizations. Um, they range from clubs for your majors. We do have Greek life on campus, as well as just um, club sports. We're um, a division one school as of beginning this past fall. So a lot of great ways for you to get involved on campus. Um, a lot of uh, what draws students to UC San Diego, other than our location, is going to be research opportunities. So uh, we are recognized as a top 15 research university worldwide. Um, I know last year it was close to $1.3 billion is what was invested in undergraduate research. Um, and I, I feel like I could spend hours just reading on all the cool things that students do. Uh, the inventor of the GoPro is an alum of UC San Diego. I know our biology students actually got to collaborate with our health staff this year. And we actually were the first university to, to launch um, masks that have like a filter in them that can actually detect COVID and if a person does have COVID, the match, the mask or the little patch changes color. So there's so many cool things that you can get involved with. Very great university for that. Um, and again, with the location, you really can't beat that. Um, so we are an out of state public school. However, um, I think one of the great things about San Diego it is it's pretty much of a transplant city. So everyone I have met here is actually not from San Diego. So I think that also is pretty reflective on our, uh, our campus community. Students are coming from all over. Um, so you will be able to meet students from other states, other parts of California, as well as all over the world. Um, but again, we are part of the UC system. We're down in San Diego, large campus, but we have an, our college system and other ways to really help give you that smaller feel, even though you are at that large research institution. So you do get to have the best of both worlds there. 
Okay, I think I'm next. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Patricia Bergantino from Providence College. So um, you may know we're about an hour south of Boston, three hours north of New York City. So we're in beautiful state of Rhode Island. Um, what makes Providence College really unique in comparison to uh, my other colleagues on this panel is that we are a small, private, Catholic, liberal arts institution. And we really prize ourselves in all those different aspects. So small, we have about 4,000 undergraduate students. We're actually the smallest school in Division I athletics, which is kind of fun. So it's a lot of spirit, small school, small classroom sizes, a lot of access to your faculty members, but a lot of pride that goes in and being a friar on campus. Um, as far as liberal arts, all students take a core curriculum in the liberal arts. And what is our defining feature is in that is the development of Western civilization. So students will study for four semesters, four credits for four semesters, um, all the great Western works that make up our different um, thoughts and philosophies. And at the end, there's a colloquium that will tie these things together. And you can choose one within your major, or outside of your major, but also Catholic. Um, so what does that mean? For us, it is a balance of faith and education. We are the only institution that is Dominican in the United States. So it really is a defining feature as far as Catholic and Dominican. Um, the Dominicans believe in the search for truth and veritas. Um, they want you to have that balance of faith and education. They want you to pursue both. But uh, again, balance is where you are now, not whenever you graduate college. So pursue your athletics, pursue your community service, but, uh, but also, um, pursue your academics that's going to get you where you want to go. So just have balance in all those different areas. And that's what we really look for in our applicants, students who can balance all those different things and bring that to Providence College. Um, other great things about Providence College is that we are a residential community. So um, if you come on campus, we are enclosed. You will see our residence halls. We also have great um, um, eateries on campus. We have a, a bar on campus, which is kind of unique. And it was actually um, started by Father McBell, a priest, <laughs> of course. Um, and so um, with that, um, if you are 21 plus, you can certainly go and enjoy a beverage on campus. Um, other th unique things about Providence College is we have wonderful state-of-the-art um, athletic facilities. Um, we have state-of-the-art um, science facilities. If you want to um, do academic research, about 37% of our students do research and they get paid for it. So that's a really great opportunity. Um, other things about um, Providence College is we have over 300 study abroad programs. 40% of our students do participate in study abroad when they're a junior and 20% when they're seniors. So our students do believe in, in exploring other shores, which is exciting for me, um, just because I work in international admissions as well. So I always tell students, go and explore, learn other different thoughts and philosophies and, and bring it back because you know, we are certainly a global world. Um, other things about Providence College as far as the application process is that we are test optional. We have been test optional for 14 years. So this is not new for us. So when the pandemic hit, we got a lot of emails about students going, I can't take the test. And we were like, that's okay. We can look at your academics. We can look at your curriculum and really understand where you are coming from, how you've invested your time on campus and what you're studying now. So we, we do understand um, where you're coming from. We are holistic in our review process and that, you know, we're not only looking at your academics, we are looking at your entire journey through high school, where you've started, where you've come from and where you're going. Um, and looking at your interests with that. Providence College offers um, 50 different majors, 35 different minors. We have over 120 different clubs and organizations. So anything academic, career oriented, but we also have water polo. Who knew? Lots of fun. Um, <laughs> so, so a lot of activities to certainly keep you engaged and getting involved. Um, so I'm going to stop there and allow my colleague um, to um, give his presentation, but we look forward to your questions and thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, Patricia. I think I'm the last to go here, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim O'Sullivan. I am the Senior Associate Director of Undergraduate Admissions at Quinnipiac University. And we are a private institution located in Hamden, Connecticut. Uh, if you're not familiar with Connecticut, we are right outside the small city of New Haven. So we are right down the road from that tiny little Ivy League called Yale. You might have heard of them. Uh, and on a grander scale from uh, the city of New Haven, you can actually hop on a train in Union Square and be in New York City or Boston very easily from our campus. So we are very strategically located 
for what we like to call uh, experiential learning, right? So we are big into internships at Quinnipiac. We're a very professional oriented school. We really love our students to be gaining that professional experience outside of the classroom, combining it with what they're learning in the classroom, uh, getting their foot in the door for potential employment, building up resumes, mock interview skills, all of that good stuff. And we are in a great location for that. Not only do we have access to New York and Boston, but again, New Haven, the capital of uh, Hartford, Connecticut is only about 25 minutes to a half hour from campus. Uh, and then we have that uh, big up and coming city of Stamford, Connecticut, right down the road from us as well. Uh, so we have access to lots of opportunity outside of the classroom. Uh, we are a medium-sized university. Uh, we have about 10,000 total students, so around 7,000 undergraduate with approximately 3,000 graduate students. Um, what that enables us to do, again, I know you've heard this term, uh, it's very popular in higher education, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, and what I mean by that is simply, we have small classroom experience, so our average classroom size is only 24 students. Uh, and again, we, ma we max our classroom sizes out, just like my colleague Todd had mentioned earlier, at 40 as well. So we don't have lecture halls at Quinnipiac University. Uh, your student to faculty ratio is 16 to 1. But then outside the classroom, we have tons of stuff to get involved with. Again, 10,000 total students. We have over 150 student-run clubs and organizations now, 21 Division I athletic programs, uh, club and intramural sports. And in fact, a major initiative at the university is to increase our amount of club sports. So that is something that we are looking to do over the next few years. Uh, fraternity and sorority life is very vibrant on campus, tons of community service, uh, local and uh, global community service opportunities with us. We have an extensive study abroad program as well. Students can go all over the world. We also, what I like to call, have domestic abroad options. Uh, we, uh, we have a Quinnipiac in Los Angeles uh, program. So many of our communications and business students take advantage of that because they're able to land internships out in LA, uh, which is a great opportunity for them. We also have a Quinnipiac in DC. So Washington DC is another uh, location that students can opt to choose to get some experience in as well. Uh, so all of these things to get involved with outside of the classroom, you get to feel like you're at a large division, division one uh, university, but yet inside the classroom, you're gonna know every professor by name. They will know you by name. Uh, you are not a tiny fish in a giant ocean at Quinnipiac at all. It is a very hands-on educational experience. Your, uh, your professors are also serving as your advisors. So we have both academic advisors who are there to just simply help you create your schedule, move through a program in the right uh, progressive state, and then also uh, professors serve as your academic advisors. So, I mean, your uh, career advisors. So each of our schools, we have seven undergraduate schools and two graduate schools. They have a, a, a staff of career development uh, officers, and they're strictly there to help you gain those professional experiences outside of the classroom. So it's a, it's a really hands-on experience. You have almost a, a support team set up for you from day one. We have over 60 undergraduate majors to choose from now. Um, I believe we're up to 48 minors as well. Some of our programs require a minor, um, but what we have at Quinnipiac, uh, what's kind of unique, uh, I know many other universities have them, but I, I am a big fan of these. And we have uh, 21 dual degree programs at Quinnipiac. And what that simply means is you're earning your bachelor's degree and your master's degree or potentially a doctorate, that's our physical therapy program, uh, in a shorter amount of time. And you know, you're saving time and money while gaining that professional experience at the same time. So like I mentioned, uh, there are nine total schools. We have our, our College of Arts and Sciences, School of Business, uh, Communications, Education, Engineering, Health Sciences, uh, and then of course, uh, Nursing, last but not least for our undergraduate schools, but we also have our own law school and our own med school at Quinnipiac. Uh, and some of those dual degree programs that we offer are in the areas of communications, business, uh, biology, uh, economics as well with an MBA, uh, radiological sciences, physical therapy, physician assistant. So I highly encourage you to go onto our website and check out some of those great opportunities in those dual degree programs. Um, and then last but not least, what I always like to just uh, finish off with is, because I know some of you are out there, you know, redoing your research, but make sure you're paying attention to deadlines. Uh, there are specific deadlines for certain majors that you're applying to, right? So definitely do your research, do your due diligence, hop on the websites of each university you're interested in, 
And please don't hesitate to reach out to your admissions counselors. That's what we're here for, okay? We're happy to put you in the best position possible uh, moving forward, okay? So thank you all for joining us tonight. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you guys so much for um, just going over a brief summary of your schools. We're gonna get into the Q&A. Um, we're gonna start with the first question from some of the attendees. The question is, is, do any of the colleges and universities have an exploratory program for freshmen who are undecided majors? I, I can start with that. At, at UMass Amherst, we have exploratory programs that are essentially our term for undecided they're by school or college. So at, at UMass, like I mentioned, 10 schools and colleges, you can't enter an undecided program for the entire university, but we have what we call exploratory tracks in most of our schools or colleges. There are a few exceptions to that. Um, engineering does not have an exploratory track. Um, nursing, for example, doesn't have an exploratory track, but most of the other schools or colleges do. You spend a semester up to, you know, probably on average a year in that exploratory track and then can move into any of the majors in that school or college or have the option to switch depending on meeting certain requirements to majors outside of that school or college if you'd like to. Um, so that's definitely an, an option on the common application or um, one that you could consider um, once you get to UMass. At Providence College, we don't have it labeled as exploratory, but you can apply undecided to um, PC. Um, with that, you will get advising, um, and they're just really going to try to help you narrow down your interests. So, for example, if you say you're interested in marketing, but maybe also psychology, you'll take um, a course that will fulfill some of your um, electives, and that and they will help you explore those different aspects and avenue. Um, you do not have to declare your major till second semester of sophomore year at PC. We do have the 48 month promise, but we do try to get you out and graduated in four years. So we do try to help you along in the process. Um, and if you, um, as you go along and you decide something's not for you, then they're gonna help you pick another course out and another major out for you to be able to um, figure out where you wanna go. I can help put a larger context on that question. So to give you a sense, um, you know, going off to college still deciding on a major is a lot more uh, typical, I guess, than you might otherwise imagine. Nationally, 30% of incoming freshmen in colleges and universities in the US, 30% start college still deciding on a major. It's the most popular major in the country. <laughs> so if you don't know what you wanna do right now at 17, 16, 17, 18 years old, that's completely normal. In fact, if you do enroll in college with a major and you have a, you know hopes and dreams and, and a passion, pursue it, but half of all students in your generation right now, half, change the major once, twice, or as many as three times. So you're gonna get exposed to stuff at college that you didn't even know existed. Topics and courses and ideas. And so give yourself that grace to evolve and change when you enroll. And I think that's why it's important that, you know, when listening to the presentations that we give tonight and the explanations of our institutions that you don't focus exclusively on major um, and that you try to find a good fit around a lot of the other criteria. But it's a great question. I think most everybody will admit, you know, still deciding students at, at some level or another, whether to a college or to its institution in general. And in most places, you don't have to declare a major until the end of your second year. And in that meantime, you're taking Common Core or what we call gen ed courses towards your degree. You can take electives, you can sample different departments. So don't feel like, you, you know, you come in still deciding on a major. It means you're going to have to, you know, spend a four and a half or five or six years trying to finish your degree, you're still earning credits towards your degree and you'll figure out what your major is gonna be when you get there. The only two other things I would add is um, uh, a lot of schools these days have um, shopping periods beginning at the end of every semester. So you can have a, um, you, you can choose your courses um, and have a schedule, but during maybe the first 10 days, first two weeks of every semester, you can, um, try a class out, see what the teacher is like, see what, check out what the syllabus is like, what you'll be reading, uh, type of work you'll be doing in that class. If you like it, if it's what you're expecting, then you can keep the class in your schedule or you can drop it and shop around and add something else. Um, not all schools do that, but there are a number of schools that offer this opportunity. Um, so again, um, you can still explore and see what else is out there before finalizing your schedule. I think the other underlying um, question behind the question about applying undecided 
uh, is um, do colleges look at whether, in terms of what you put down on your application and, and does that affect your application decision? Um, for many of us, no, it does not matter since um, we know that you are still in high school and you have no idea what you wanna study yet. Um, and you have until the end of your sophomore year, like Todd said, to declare your major or two or three. Um, and uh, so we just wanna see if you have any idea what you're interested in right now, um, that's really helpful. Um, and we're not going to, to um, set it in stone once you are admitted that you have to major in physics and religion or in biology or neuroscience or English. Um, we know that you're gonna change your mind, but we would just like to know what you're thinking about um, as a senior in high school right now when you're applying. Okay, I think we're gonna move on to the next question. This was specifically aimed at UMass, but I think it would be um, interesting to hear what everyone else has to say. Um, the question was, by what date does uh, UMass or colleges let their applicants know whether they've been accepted and what should applicants do if they have not re received a response yet? So we can start with UMass and then if anyone else has any comments. Yeah, um, so at UMass Amherst, we have kind of two decision plans. We have the early action plan and we have regular decision. For early action, students apply by November 5th and they'll receive an admissions decision usually by mid to late January and then have until May 1 to say yes or no. If students apply regular decision, they have until mid-January, January 15th, to apply. And then they get their admissions decision usually um, in mid to late February. Um, we did, we received a large volume of applications this year, um, as most of, of my colleagues probably experienced. And so some of our regular decision, admissions decisions um, were rolled out into March. But if a student applied by that deadline, then they should have received an admission decision by this point in time in the process. Um, we do, like a lot of um, public flagships, our common application is left open for a whole host of reasons. A great example, if you've read in the news, Becker College closing in Worcester, a lot of the vet um, tech students and animal science majors were allowing them to apply to UMass, even though our, our deadline is passed. So if you know someone who recently applied to UMass because of a situation like that, they may have not received a decision yet because we're actively reviewing those later applications to help accommodate um, students who are put in a tough position because of that. But other than that, most decisions should be out. If a student didn't get one, it could be that their, their application was incomplete and they should check their portal or they could follow up um, with us in the admissions office and we could look into that too. Um, I'll go next. So for UC San Diego specifically, we release decisions for first year students typically around the middle of March. Anyone applying as transfer students can expect to get their deadlines by the middle of April. Um, the entire UC system has one application timeline. Um, so none of the UCs have early action, early decision. Each campus, they, they release their decisions at different dates, but all students are notified at the same time with their decisions. Um, so if a student has applied to us, by middle March, if they're not hearing a decision, then they want to reach out with us because there means something is going on there. Um, but otherwise, it's just one application timeline for all UCs, and we release all our decisions out um, at the same date. At Quinnipiac, we actually have a pretty clear and straightforward uh, application process that's listed on the website. Uh, there's literally four different ways you can apply. That's all. First one's early decision, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And if you're not, that is the legal binding agreement that you actually sign saying, if you admit me to my first choice major, I am coming to Quinnipiac. So that is strictly for students that are 150% sure where the proper university for them. Uh, and you know, there's nowhere else that they can see themselves attending, right? So the, de the deadline for early decision is November 1st and those students receive their decision letters first. They will get them in mid-December. The next way to apply is early action one. And this is, and I can't emphasize this enough if any of you are out there, I think I did see already one question relating to nursing. This is how you must apply if you're applying to any competitive selective majors at our university. And that is nursing, the direct entry, six year master's degree in physician assistant, the six or seven uh, doctorate in physical therapy program, the five and a half year occupational therapy program. Those programs specifically, you must apply early action one. The deadline is November 15th. Those students get their decision letters in mid-January. 
Then, of course, for anybody applying to our general admission criteria areas, such as business communications, the arts and sciences, uh, engineering, education, we have early action two, and that deadline is January 1st. They get their decision letters next. So we have a few decision drops, as you can see. They get them in early February. Regular admission is for those students that maybe Quinnipiac got on their radar a little bit late. Maybe they were waiting to visit us in person before they applied. Uh, and that absolute deadline is February 1st. They get their decision letters last in mid-March. Again, if you're applying to any of the general admission criteria areas, so, you know those majors that are outside of those health science areas and nursing, we are going to be extremely flexible uh, with students and families. I can, for example, we're still accepting applications right now. Uh, and again, just like my colleagues all mentioned, please, please pay attention to your student status portals to make sure that all your materials are in. Because if you're not getting a decision letter, there's a reason why, you know, so you read that again, I can't emphasize enough, reach out to your admissions counselors, find out why, check your status portal, stay on top of things. Uh, this way you're not missing any important deadlines or anything like that. So um, similar to Quinnipiac, we have four admission cycles as well. We have um, early action, early decision, which are both November 1st, and you'll find out uh, mid-December. So it's a very busy time of year for us during those few weeks that we are reading applications, having committee, and keeping our eyes open with coffee, lots and lots of coffee. Um, and then we have um, early decision two and regular decision that are due by January 15th. Early decision two is released mid-February and regular decision is also is released mid-March. And so we, we let students know about their decisions. Um, we unfortunately, um, we send a bunch of emails and we will always let you know what we are missing from you. So please make sure that you're checking your emails. And I say that because what ends up happening is if we've emailed you 20 different times about missing a document, then you will get a deny incomplete because you were not able to finish your file. So make sure you are paying attention to your emails. And I say that as cheerfully as I possibly can. As, and we're trying to help you. We do reach out to you um, several different times, um, but just make sure that you are also responding to us. I think on, for everyone, I cover the South Shore, for everyone you'll say, you have my, my contact information at the bottom of that email. You can always email me and you are getting an email live from me. So always very exciting. We're always happy to help you. So, um, yeah. So I'm actually going to jump out of the queue on this one. So <laughs> I didn't say in my introduction, but I'm the father of three teenagers. My oldest is actually a senior this year. Uh, so to be in this business right alongside a kid doing a college search was uh, put my day to day in a whole different perspective. But on the topic of emails, you know, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is because students, I know you probably are communicating daily on Snapchat and Lord knows what else other app is in vogue these days. But you know, the rest of us older folks tend to use emails. And certainly, uh, institutionally speaking, that's how we're going to try to reach out to you guys. But my advice is, though, you know, as you start your college search process, students create a new email address that you're going to use just for your college search process. But more importantly, parents, make sure you also have access to that account. I have it, it, it downloads on my iPad that I keep at home so that, you know, my son and I can literally be on the same page. You know, you apply to like 10 different colleges and all these communications come in and, you know, missing documents or different events. And, you know, and it helps. Families are busy. Students are especially busy, you know. And so to be able to literally have the whole family on the same page as these communications come in, I think it just helps to coordinate schedules and, you know, getting documents out or what events you're going to attend and those sorts of things. So that would be my advice, you know, create a special email account just for search, both students and parents have it. And at the end of your college search process, you can just walk away from it and let it collect all the junk emails that you'd be getting for eternity. So just want to add that in from my own personal experience. And then finally, I'm just, I'm not going to provide deadlines. Um, all of our information is on our websites. Um, and so just heard from four different schools that have four different um, schedules. Uh, so my advice is just to stay organized throughout this entire process. Every school you, you apply to actually may have a different deadline in terms of when to submit your application, but also when they're going to release their decisions. Um, so create a schedule um, that's easy to, to understand for you uh, and your folks um, and literally put down all the big important deadlines in terms of not just admission applications, but also financial aid deadlines, 
um, maybe scholarship applications that you may be applying for as well, um, and get it all consolidated into one calendar. Um, and that's gonna help you stay organized, at least hopefully, ideally, to stay organized throughout this really um, next few years of the college search process. Thank you, everyone. Um, the next question is was aimed for Daryl um, at Bates, but I think anybody who wants to answer it, go for it. Um, with virtual classes, my daughter's grades have dropped. What impact has that had on applicants? Sure. I can start since it was <laughs> addressed to me, but I'm happy to uh, pass the baton to others as well. Um, but for the most part, we read applications, um, Tricia mentioned the word holistically. Uh, so um, we will read everything on your transcript, but also everything else in your application from recommendations, essays, activities. But in terms of your transcript itself, um, we look at trends, not just your senior year or not just this year during COVID. Um, so if you were a solid student all four years, great. Um, if your grades were going up, um, that's good too. If your grades were dipping um, and there was no reason, that could be problematic. But if there was a reason for the dip, let us know. Um, beyond COVID, maybe um, your parents went through a really bad divorce and that affected you academically, or you transferred schools, came out in high school, bullied in high school. Whatever the reason is, let us know. There's a whole section on application for additional information. Uh, feel free to use that section to provide this type of context if you feel comfortable enough sharing uh, that information with us. If you don't feel comfortable, have your counselor write about it in his or her recommendation to us instead. Um, but in terms of COVID impact, um, the, both the common application and the coalition application this year um, added an optional question for students on the application, but also an optional section for counselors to provide um, the context of what happened and, and how COVID impacted the school um, in terms of the counselor perspective, but also how COVID impacted the student and their family um, in the application. And so completely optional, um, but a lot of students this year um, use that section to let us know maybe um, parents were furloughed or parents lost both of their jobs um, and they had to get a job um, and as well to help pay. Um, maybe they have an autoimmune uh, disease uh, or condition that, that uh, affected them. Um, maybe it affected them in terms of their mental health. So all these things came out in that optional essay. Um, and that's a great place to provide the information, say if grades dropped or um, something affected you uh, because of COVID. So we will see all of that and understand uh, that the uh, remote learning was not the best uh, learning environment for many students. Um, and we will take that into consideration as we read applications during the pandemic. I just want to add, especially for those of you who are juniors, um, some institutions offer interviews in the summertime. Um, and for example, Providence College, it is optional to have an interview. Highly encouraged, but it is optional. And so with that, um, you want to make sure that if you have that chance, take it, take us up on it, you know, whether you can meet with us virtually or in person because that is a great time to meet face-to-face -face with an admission officer and also let them know what was going on. Because certainly when you apply, they'll say, oh, I met with a student and you know, mom and dad worked in the medical field. I had to take care of younger brother and sisters and go to classes, you know, whatever the situation that was going on, just make sure that um, you're reaching out and letting us know. If you don't feel comfortable putting that in, you know, you're, if you're applying the common app application, you don't wanna have that to every school that you're reaching out to. Um, reach out to individual schools and they can certainly help you um, relay that information to your admission office or the committees for where we're coming. Thanks everyone. Some really great questions everybody's asking. Another question I have is, um, I've heard from another webinar that students can list extracurricular activities on their application even if they were canceled by COVID. For example, a student can list softball for spring 2020 if they, if they would have tried out, even if try our, tryouts weren't held, or list volunteer that was cut short by the pandemic. Is this accurate? And how are schools considering extracurricular stuff at this time? So 
sorry to jump in again here, um, but just to go back to the COVID optional question or the additional information section, that's a great place to include that type of information um, rather than the activity section. Uh, usually students will use the activity section for things that they've done ninth, 10th, um, that actually happened um, and that they were doing uh, throughout high school. Um, but this year I saw many applicants uh, using that optional um, COVID question or the um, additional information section to say, you know, uh, this summer I was supposed to do this internship, um, but because of COVID, it was canceled. Um, in the fall, I was planning to do X, Y, and Z, but because of COVID, because of remote learning, um, all of these were suspended. And so, um, again, it's you can you can definitely share with us in terms of you know, um, uh, particularly if it was a competitive process to get that um, position or that job or that internship. Um, so definitely mention it, um, but I wouldn't list it under sort of the activities that you have actually done in high school. I just also wanted to add um, if for students and families, if there has been a situation where um, your grades have been impacted, you can also speak with your um, school counselor and we're happy to make phone calls to admissions reps and have conversations about any situations that maybe you're not necessarily comfortable again putting in writing or even making that phone call on your own. So um, definitely speak to your uh, guidance counselor if that's something that um, you feel is uh, an issue and you want to have discussed with uh, an admissions counselor. Um, I know we have another question. My computer just froze. So hold on one second. I can go ahead, Corey, and ask. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Given the COVID restrictions, what do you recommend for a potential student to do in order to get to the feel of a school that you normally would get from a campus visit? I can hop in there. We're hosting visits. Uh, so <laughs> um, if you're comfortable, of course, you know, coming to see a campus in person, unfortunately, right now we are not allowing juniors uh, for obvious reasons because of our uh, reduced capacity size of tours. We're only doing tours right now for our admitted students, but uh, juniors will be allowed to visit as soon as, you know, I would, I'm guessing mid to late May, most likely is when that's gonna start. Uh, so, you know, definitely keep an eye out on the universities and colleges websites that you're interested in potentially visiting because I, I'm getting the feeling that many schools are starting to open up a little bit for tours, uh, again, on a reduced capacity. So you wanna make sure you get ahead of it and uh, pick out a date and time that work best for you and your family. But other options, of course, are virtual tours. We have tons of virtual options on our website. We are content heavy, just like all of my fellow panelists, I'm sure right now, given what we all have gone through together, uh, you know, over the last you know, year. Um, and then of course, you know, YouTube videos for many universities, like we do some really detailed residential hall tours through on YouTube, which are really, really cool. You can check that out. Uh, so you have those virtual options, but I, over the summer, I can tell you for Quinnipiac, at least we are absolutely going to be open for you. And I believe one of my panels mentioned in the fall, I think it might've been Providence, uh, planning on going fully on ground. We are as well. So we're planning on going back to, to normal in the fall, fingers crossed. Uh, you know, so definitely, uh, you know, take a look at all the options that every uni university has in terms of visiting, because I think that's a really important aspect of your college search process for sure. Yeah, I, I would echo what Tim just said. I mean, Bridgewater also, we have tours available now. Uh, it's one tour guide to one prospective student and their families. We keep social distancing, we wear masks. The, I think there's only one building we go into. So you can do it. Uh, short of that though, however, if you're interested in schools that don't currently offer organized tours, if you can, I recommend driving up there, you know, or down there or over there, I should say, to wherever it is you wanna go uh, and step foot on the campus. Cause honestly, I mean, being in the business and having gone through a college search with my son recently, you know, you don't get the same sensation on a college website or in glossy brochures or in our virtual events. Cause honestly, we all are gonna put pictures of our beautiful buildings and our shiniest, happiest people, you know? Uh, <laughs> and it's just the nature of the, of the, of the industry. And, and you want us to foot on the campus to see, you know, 
all aspects of that campus and to perhaps picture yourself as a member of that community. That's the other important thing. That's a struggle even now with our de-densified campus populations. You know, hopefully this summer you get a chance to step foot on campus for juniors going into your senior year, absolutely get out there. I'm a huge proponent. Do not put down a deposit on a campus if you have not set foot on it. Think about it. You wouldn't buy a car unless you take it for a test drive, right? You're about to spend way more on your education than you will your first half dozen vehicles. So, um, you know, take them for a test drive, kick the tires, walk around, you know, get to get a sense of whether it's where you want to be for the next four years. And if it's the kind of community you want to be associated with for the rest of your life, it's a big, big decision. So don't do it unless you take it for a test drive. I, I was just going to say, I would add um, a lot of our schools um, probably have student ambassadors as well that you can reach out to. And so even though you may have not been able to physically hear from them in person, they can certainly, um, I know our school, um, our students are happy to talk to you. They're happy to reach out to you either um, via Zoom or um, email and so forth. And um, and I, um, I was taught that at PC, we do not have official tours for juniors going on right now either, ours as well as, um, as for admitted senior, seniors. With that though, if you are a junior and you come to campus, our security will give you a QR code that you can scan and you can have a self-guided tour right on your phone. Um, so, and I'm sure we are not the only campus that is offering that right now. Um, um, I'm sure my other panelists are as well but we definitely go and check out the campus. Um, see what we are offering to you virtually, either preview days, um, so you can kind of get an idea of a campus that way. And then if you have a chance to drive down over to a campus and see them even with the self-credit tour, um, those are some great ways to really check out the campus. Um, I'll hop in here just because we're exactly not down the street. Um, so being so far away, I think it even throws such a, an even bigger challenge because we don't want a student to commit to us all the way on the other side of the country without having to come to visit. Our campus actually is still completely closed. We're not offering tours and it also still is closed to the public. Um, so what I would add, just ditto to everything that everyone has said, um, just know we are trying to be as creative as we can. I actually feel since the pandemic, one of the things that has come to this is I feel like I've actually been able to connect more with students um, just through the virtual platform because even before the pandemic, it's hard for students who are so far away to get out to us. Um, but for you to also be creative, one thing that I have seen with our admitted students, which I think is so cool, they've been on our Instagram page just leaving comments like, hey, are there any current students who can just like follow me? I can follow you. And we have actually had some of our admitted students who have found random current students who are on campus who are like, yeah, I'll, I'll FaceTime you so you can come see this building or you know, just giving them pictures that they've had from their experience. So um, don't be afraid to ask just because again, we know how challenging it is to see campuses right now. So if you think it might be a possibility, reach out to us and, and we can see if there's a way possible for, the, uh, for you for that. Thanks guys. Um, we're gonna go on to the next question. Um, we're gonna break this question into two parts only because um, it's about standardized testing. And I think this is, brings a lot of questions to families. The question is, are you going to be asking for ACT or SAT scores for kids in the fall of 2023 and 2022? And how strongly are you considering test scores? I'm happy to kick this off. Um, at UMass Amherst um, and all of the UMass campuses, we are currently test optional. At UMass Amherst, we are test optional through 2023. Um, so we had a, we have a three-year pilot to look at what test optional means, and then we'll revisit and reevaluate. So if you're considering applying to UMass for fall 22 or fall 23, it is a test optional admissions process, which means you are not required nor expected to submit a test score. And I'm sure others can elaborate on this. If you do choose to submit a test score, we will consider it as a just like we would anything else optional that you choose to submit. So just keep that in mind. I mean, you can talk to your admission counselor um, and your counselors about whether or not it's a wise decision to submit that test score before you actually do so. So we're happy to engage in that conversation. Uh, so I can echo exactly what Mike had just said. Uh, we are um, test optional as well. You know, again, given the circumstances, we're going to be flexible uh, with everybody uh, moving forward. But 
does that mean you should just not even try to take it? No, you know, if you have an option of taking an SAT or ACT, why not? Because it could potentially help, uh, you know, boost your application and your file with the university. Now, there are two programs, and this is why I wanted to hop in. We do have two programs where, although we are test optional, we highly recommend that you try to get a test score in for these. And these are two of those dual degree programs that I mentioned. Uh, and that is our direct entry six year master's degree program in physician assistant. And that is simply because it's by far our most selective program. So a test score can really help a student. Uh, and it also helps our review committee differentiate. We had over 700 applications for that program this year for 25 spots. So test scores help on both sides. Uh, and then the other one is if you're interested in our dual degree program in law. So if you're interested in uh, going into law, we have a three plus three JD program and the law school does like to see test scores if they can. But again, if you're unable to get a test score into us, we will absolutely review your application without it. Um, and an open conversation with your admissions counselor, just like Mike had said, that's a, that's a great opportunity to connect with us and see whether or not you should submit a score that you may have if you're unclear on whether or not it'll help or hurt your application. I'd like to jump in to clarify not just the policy of Bridgewater, but for the other uh, eight uh, state universities here in Massachusetts. So uh, all state universities, including Mass College of Liberal Arts, Mass Maritime and Mass Art and Design, we all have the same admission standards given to us by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And for those standards, uh, you apply, we recalculate your grade point average. If you're above a B average, a 3.0 or higher, the standards allow us to admit you automatically. So you don't have to send test scores, in which case it's completely uh, a, a viable option for you to you know, apply test optional. At Bridgewater, however, and at any of the state universities for that matter, if you're below a 3.0 GPA, it's really in your best interest to send test scores, if you're able to take them, of course. And this year, you know, the COVID crisis has canceled them all over the place. So you know, if you can do a test score, then what ends up happening is that we as admissions professionals at the state universities use what we call a sliding scale. It may even be in your program of study at Hanover High School or other public high schools. You can find it online. But the idea is that the lower below, the further below a 3.0 you have and the higher your test scores are, you could still qualify for admission, right? So there's actually six different categories of GPA ranges from a 299 down to a 2.0. And there are corresponding required minimum SAT or ACT scores. So if your GPA band matches up with a standardized test score, the required minimum, you're in, you meet the state standards. So it's in your benefit to send us those test scores. Uh, but you know, even if you don't match up with the with the uh, with the sliding scale, or if you're unable to take a test, or if you just decide not to send a test, then that's when we start to dig in the other aspects of your application packet, at least at Bridgewater. So, you know, you'll never be penalized at a state university here in Massachusetts for sending test scores. It can only work to your advantage. Um, to my advice would be certainly if you have the opportunity, you know, try to take them and then decide whether you want to send them to institutions or not after you've spoken to the admissions professionals, as as my colleagues have said. Um, so for the UC system, for fall 2021, all campuses were completely test blind. For fall 2022 and beyond, um, the UC system actually is still currently in litigation with the state of California. However, I know we do have a few of our campuses who have already made the decision that they will be test blind. I believe it was Santa Barbara, Berkeley, and I cannot remember the other one. Um, so uh, that's the biggest question that we get and it's kind of frustrating for us as well because we can't give you the answer. So just stay tuned. Um, but I do know prior to um, COVID, the UC system actually announced to, uh, a decision to try and phase out the SAT and ACT requirement by 2025. Um, if you visit University of California Office of the President, you can actually see um, year by year kind of what the plan was for progressing to that. But currently we are test blind. That could potentially change. My personal opinion, I don't think it will. So we probably will remain test blind, um, but we keep telling students and families to stay tuned for that. The only other thing that I would add is um, just to remind students that tests uh, test optional does not mean grade optional. Um, and there are a lot of students this year who heard, oh, this school, that school, this university has gone test optional. I have seen some of my transcript, but this is my year to apply to that institution, even though they only take 5% of their, of their applicant pool. So make sure that you can still fit the profile of what that school is looking for. Um, just because they have become test optional doesn't mean uh, that it's um, um, a shoe in for everybody. Uh, so they still will look at standards. They still have standards in terms of when 
they're looking at applications and are doing them. Um, and the transcript will always be the most important thing because it will cover three and a half years uh, when you apply, three and a half years of high school versus three and a half hours in, on a Saturday morning taking a test. I would just want to say I agree with Daryl 100%. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Providence College has been test optional for the last 14 years, but we look heavily on the work that you've done day in and day out for the last three and a half years, three years. Um, so um, that being said, we know that there have been a reduction in um, some of the more rigorous courses that you can take. Let us know how your schedule has been impacted because that's going to be important. Um, and if that and if anything has been impacted um, due to COVID, you know, grade wise or so forth. So that, you know, especially if you are going test optional, um, it just helps us a little bit more understand where you're coming from. I could add one more small tip that I just thought of. Um, and this is worth for any school that you are considering, even if a school may be test blind or test optional, you may want to check in about scholarships because I know do some schools do, if they may not consider scholarships for admission, there may be certain merit scholarships or other scholarships that they actually will consider test scores for. So just to double check with any school that you are applying to regarding those scholarships. Thanks guys. Um, the second part of that question was if your child is interested in STEM, how much um, on the SAT or the ACT is weighted for having really good math scores, but maybe not doing as well on the other parts of the test? So I was just gonna say, I would, as far as Providence College, we're actually looking at a couple of things. Did you take um, biology, chemistry, physics? And then the other part we're looking at is what level of math did you get to in your high school curriculum? Did you get to pre-calc? Are you in calculus? Where are you? Or did you take stats? And why did you take that? So we were looking more at your progression in your courses if you don't have um, math scores for the SAT. The only thing I was going to add is we at UMass this year of the students who applied to STEM fields, especially things like computer science or engineering, of those we admitted, only about a third had an SAT or an ACT score. So to Trisha's point, we're looking well beyond, even if a student submits a score, the focus is on the academic coursework, the performance in those courses, because that gives us the best lens as to whether or not a student will be prepared to thrive um, for those four years in the classroom like we've all talked about, the testing can be a nice kind of side benefit to go, oh, and they did well on the SAT subject test or the SAT math section. That's kind of a confirming piece. Um, so that's really the only way it could be of great benefit to you other than some scenarios people have talked about where it could help you for a scholarship or for the review that those years of math and science-based coursework are going to be much more um, critical to the review. This next question is one that we got um, a few times. What do colleges expect or what do they look for in college essays? I can start. So um, the college essay is probably the most stressful for all of you as students, but to be honest, sometimes for us, this, um, for us on this side of the desk, it is the most fun. Um, and uh, it is not an assignment in terms of choosing the most bizarre or the most interesting topic. It is more an exercise in terms of how you think and how you write and how you express yourself in 650 words or less. So you could actually take the most mundane thing in the world and make it the most interesting thing that we have ever read. So if you could take us out of our offices and into your life for five minutes, we would consider that a successful college essay. So I've been doing this for 22 years and every single year, I photocopy my favorite essays and all of them at this point are in binders and folders in my office. And if you read any of them, you will soon learn that all of them are usually about nothing. Um, they're very, very Seinfeldian in the sense that they're just the moment in someone's ordinary life that we can't find anywhere else in the application. So my favorite essay of all time in 22 years was actually from a young woman on Cape Cod um, who talked about taking a walk on a beach on a Sunday afternoon with her grandfather. So, Topic was very simple, it was very ordinary, 
but in terms of the way she wrote it, not only was her writing poetic and lyrical, it was very mature, very insightful, and very self-reflective for someone who was only, I don't know, 17 or 18 years old and still in high school. So um, if you're not funny in real life, please, please, please don't try to be funny in your essay. It rarely ever works. Um, uh, you're meeting us today. We like to, we wanna to get to know you. So we love stories about you. Um, make sure they're, they're about you um, and make sure you're answering the question that is um, asked in the prompt. Um, uh, but I always tell students to avoid what I call the four Ds, death, divorce, depression, and my favorite, dating. Um, you can probably write a great one about death, divorce, or depression, but it's really, really hard to do so in 650 words or less in a mature, insightful way. Um, dating essays are just bad in general. I don't think I've ever read a good dating one ever. Um, I read a student essay about a student's first time in the bedroom. Yeah, I don't think I could even finish that essay. But mind you, the essay is not meant to shock us. We've literally read everything under the sun at this point. So don't worry about the topic. It's again, all about how you write that essay. So my last, last piece of advice about the essay is always, always remember that a long, bad essay is worse than a short, bad essay. So keep that in mind. Um, so for the UC system, we require what we call personal insight questions. And for us, they function a little bit differently than kind of a traditional college essay. And that's mainly just because with us and the volume of applications that we get, um, the UC system, none of the campuses actually consider letters of recommendation. We don't do interviews. We don't take in um, like counselor recommendations. So your personal insight questions are for us really the only way to learn more about your personality, your goals, anything that obstacles that you've had to overcome outside of the classroom. Um, there's eight that you have to choose from. You pick four. Each question um, has a maximum response of 350 words. Um, and so we always tell students there's no right or wrong answer. It doesn't matter what question you pick. The best thing, um, just again reiterating what's been said already, is you want to write about yourself. You don't want to try and write about what you think we want to hear. You don't want to create a whole different persona about yourself. Um, you don't need to go out of your way to pick the most interesting topic. We really are just using these to learn more about yourself. Um, I, to this day, will always remember, I read a personal insight question about Beyonce. And to this day, I, I still have it saved in my computer, just the way the student was able to relate why they love Beyonce and how they hope to bring those same qualities to our campus, it just really stuck out to me. So um, if you're not a creative person, you don't need to go to thesaurus.com and, and just start filling in a whole bunch of words just to make it sound better. Um, we're not expecting it to be like a perfect research essay. Of course, the flow, the grammar, all that stuff matters, but you're not writing a thesis. You really are just writing to help us to learn more about you. Um, so just keep that in mind and, and have fun with your, your personal insight questions as well. Now, um, a lot of schools are offering, um, I know we are specifically, um, different uh, webinars on how to write a good essay. And um, last year, our school allowed juniors to submit their essay and we would give you feedback. So before you had submitted your app on your application, just you know where you could expand and improve. So look for those opportunities see if um, there's any online programming that's being offered. Again, I know visiting can be difficult, um, but it might be a great way if you have a topic or an idea and you've already started writing on it, so you can get feedback from that um, perspective, perspective school that you're very interested in. I do the nature of the state uh, university admission standards. I'll be honest, we're only reading essays if we have to. Uh, if you reach the 3.0 threshold, we're moving on. You got, you know, tens of thousands of uh, applications to review. If you're on the sliding scale, again, we don't dig into it. So uh, we're reading essays at the state university level uh, for those cases where you're, uh, you're a bubble applicant, you know, and so it's really an opportunity for you to tell us whatever it is that's been going on in your life that's been keeping you from being as successful as you think you can be if you're offered admission at the institution where you've applied. You know, so it, it's those sorts of insight answers that are really helpful. But at the end of the day, you know, again, for us, it, the essay can actually hurt you more than it can help you. And by that, I mean, just be careful that you're writing a cohesive, you know, logical thesis, that it's that it's proofread, that the grammar's correct, the spelling's correct, um, you know, and then otherwise it's, you know, it's just one of many aspects in application that we're going to read to, you know, read if, if we need to. 
And so, you know, I know again, some of the institutions in tonight's event are gonna put more of an emphasis on essays than, than others, uh, but at least for the state universities, that's where we stand with it. I just wanted to add that um, just for the sake of time, the, there are some questions that are specifically towards some of the universities in the Q&A. So um, keep an eye on the Q&A box because the uh, um, admissions counselors may be responding to those in the Q&A. So um, if you feel like we've skipped your question, it's just because they have answered it in the um, Q&A uh, box. Um, one of the questions that um, we get a lot is when you are going to apply for a major, if you apply undecided, is that hurtful to your application or should you just declare a major? So I didn't know if anyone could comment on that. Um, the only thing I would say about that is in most cases, it's always good to talk to the admissions representative or your college counselors about this because it will vary from university to university. For example, at, at UMass, there could be a certain major you want and you should apply directly into that major because you may not be able to gain admission if you come into an undecided program, even in that school or college, it's not a guarantee. So you wouldn't want to inadvertently set yourself up for um, a situation that you're not happy with. Um, but in most cases, you can usually go from an undecided program into most majors that a college or university would offer, but there will usually be some restrictions because of space um, and, and the competitive nature of the program. Um, so those would be some great questions to talk with your, your college counselors or those of us who work in admissions at, or at any university. And I would just piggyback off of that. Um, I know that we have a lot of students who apply undecided sometimes as a backdoor into the School of Business at PC, and it doesn't work because we're still gonna go back and look at your curriculum. Again, did you take pre-calc, skipped calc? What, what courses did you take? Because the School of Business faculty says that that's what you're going to need. And so if you, there are those niche programs that schools have, if you apply undecided as a way of getting into it, it, it may not work in your favor. So I totally agree with that. All right, um, the next question um, was, what do you look for students when they're applying to a school specifically in nursing programs? So for Quinnipiac, I can tell you, you know, nursing program uh, at our university, we're gonna look at your math and science grades a little bit heavier than, obviously we're a holistic review, just like everybody else, but uh, you know, your math and science grades are really gonna be telling uh, in terms of whether or not you have that strong foundation uh, of knowledge to move through the program with success, right? And that's what we really want is to set you up for success. So those two subject areas are weighed a little bit heavier. Um, again, your overall GPA absolutely comes into play. So you want to make sure you're performing well in your other courses. And then last but not least, I, normally in a traditional world, we would love to see a student with experience. So some sort of shadowing or, you know, uh, you know, follow, uh, volunteering work in a hospital. But given the world we're living in, we completely understand that that's not possible uh, for some of you out there. So uh, what we encourage students to do in, in their supplemental essay. So for Quinnipiac University, if you're applying to nursing, you are required to do a shorter essay specifically to why nursing. So what I highly recommend if you're unable to get any shadowing or volunteer work or professional experience is to just simply do as much research as you possibly can, right? So let us know exactly why nursing. Uh, what knowledge do you have on the nursing career? What are your career goals, you know, as you move forward, that kind of thing. So it, it's really important to be familiar with the major, the career, you know, and what that entails and what your, uh, you know, goals are in, in the end game. But definitely, you know, academics come into play as specifically math and science for us. Um, I can answer this question very quickly. We do not have a nursing program, so you don't have to worry about meeting any requirements for us. And I would just <clears throat> echo a lot of what Tim said. We have our the school of nursing at, at UMass. The big piece of this is in there's this part of the application, our application, where you can look, talk about why nursing. 
And a big part of that is that that genuine care and concern for people, um, you know, like the and that comes across in the narrative answer there. And so I think that's what we really stress to applicants is we have more than enough applicants for the avail small number of spaces available. So it's really understanding what you've done or what you're planning to do um, to make a difference in people's lives. Um, so that's a big part of it. Okay, can, could each of you guys just briefly describe the campus culture? You can see we're all hesitant. It is hard to describe the ethos or culture of a place because it's gonna be different for every student. Um, their experience is gonna be different for, uh, for each individual student that we admit to our schools. Um, for the most part, um, at least at Bates, uh, not competitive, very collaborative environment um, where a lot of group work, a lot of group presentations will happen. Um, and uh, it's a place that, because we're in Maine, a lot of students love the outdoors. Um, they love to be adventurous, um, but it's a place that, given our mission statement, um, we're looking for students that really um, are attuned to, aware of, um, believe in the tenets of diversity, access, and inclusion, and want to um, have be in those conversations and help find the solutions to issues um, that are affecting the country right now. Um, so, I mean, again, it's going to be hard, uh, and I don't know if we have time to, to really dissect the cultures of each of our institutions, but uh, going back to that, how do you learn about a school, um, and whether it's social media, whether it's uh, checking out newspapers uh, of each school online and what, uh, what are the prominent stories that students are talking about and interested in. Um, those are just some ways to really get to know uh, the personality of an institution um, without really um, being on campus. I definitely have an answer on this one because we do an annual survey every year of, uh, of students on our campus. Uh, a, a campus climate survey and consistently you know, students who are at Bridgewater who graduate from Bridgewater uh, indicate that Bridgewater is a friendly and welcoming place. You know, I think I like to think that we set the, the tone right from the jump with our motto not to be diminished un, unto but to minister which you know, it's a line from the Bible. I'm not a theologian. I don't break it down that level. I'm political scientist by training. So for me, it means, you know, not to be served, but to serve. And if you think about it, I mean, to serve is what our students aspire to do. When you think that three of our four most popular majors track students into what I call the helping professions, education, criminal justice, and psychology. It doesn't even begin to include the countless students in our school of social work or going to public service from political science or any of our majors, right? But when you have the majority of your students who are making sacrifices to earn degrees where they want to help other people for a living, it sets the tone of the culture for a campus. You see in a whole host of ways. I mean, the, the way that almost every visitor cites under normal circumstances is that we hold doors open for people, which does seem weird in this day and age where nobody wants to grab a door handle without a rubber glove on. But right under normal circumstances, it's what we do. It's not just our students either, it's our staff, it's our faculty. And I've been on our campus now for 15 years and, and you know, we're literally a community of people who care who's coming through the door behind us. And you, you just have to feel that for yourself. You know, and again, it's the importance of visiting these campuses. Um, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to be. It's a good culture and it's a hardworking student body. 65% of our students work full or part-time to pay the way through school. So it's not pizza and beer money. That's tuition and fee money, right? So our students are also known for their work ethic. You know, the, there isn't a sense of entitlement. They roll up their sleeves, they get to work, they get stuff done, you know? And for students who are worried about going to a school with a good brand identity, work ethic's not a bad brand to be associated with if what you want is a job at the end of this process, right? And employers recognize that. So that's how I would describe Bridgewater's culture and the students who attend our campus. Um, this question, I think, is is great because it's very timely. Um, right now, high schools are going through the process of course selection um, and picking classes, uh, or maybe they have already. Um, Hanover is, will be doing it in the next couple of weeks. Um, we get a lot of questions about foreign language and how many years would you recommend that a student take? And also, if they have a specific major, like let's say they're going into business, um, what types of classes would you recommend that you would like to see on a transcript? So at Providence College, we actually like to see four years of a foreign language. 
you know, um, it's, it's okay that you get to level four your junior year of high school. And, you know, we just want to see that you've um, gone through one language for four years. So that's, you know, consistent. So sometimes we see students who took Spanish for two years and then they switch over to Mandarin, you know, um, that's not necessarily consistent. And so we really like to see that follow through. Um, with that at PC, we're looking at your core courses for admission, English, math, social science, um, and the foreign language. And so those are what we value. And so I know I saw the question in there asking specifically to, about business and marketing. I, I think it's okay to take those courses, but um, especially when you have a lot of students who are um, looking to go into school of business at PC, we really want to know what level of math. So if, if you have a choice between that marketing course or the pre-calc course, take the pre-calc course you know, get to that next level or the CALC course for us. We want, we want to see you challenge yourself in the core academics um, because when you come to campus, we're going we're gonna to give you all that back, um, business background that you're looking for. So that's, um, that's from our perspective. On, and kind of on behalf of the public universities of Massachusetts, there's a minimum requirement of two courses in a language other than than English, um, as you can imagine, to be more competitive for admission. If you go beyond the minimum requirements, you stand a better chance of being kind of comparable to the students who are also applying to a university. So most at, at UMass Amherst, we usually see students who have taken three or four language, three or four years <laughs> of a language other than English. Um, and so that's that's pretty much the norm. If a student had that available to them, or they had an available alternative um, if something happened at the school. I mean, it was, something wasn't available that they had been taking for a few years. So again, back to what we talked about tonight, being transparent, telling us about that in the application is always a good thing to do. So we understand each situation. Um, just to add to that question, uh, how do you view having AP courses um, on a transcript? Do you find that if a student um, if there was an opportunity to take an AP calculus and they didn't, does that hurt their transcript? How do you view that sort of thing in admissions? So as a test optional school, um, we look at the rigor that a student has taken as part of the admission con um, the um, admission process. So what is the strength of the application? And um, what is the strength of the academics? You know, how did they progress? And so it's not that a student will necessarily be penalized because they didn't take AP calculus, but you may at the end, if you had the choice to take an AP and all core subjects would be considered for a merit scholarship versus not being considered for a merit scholarship. And so that's where you have to look at, especially in the world of test optional, if you can take the challenge and it's appropriate for you, it's always encouraged. If it would overwhelm you academically, then you know possibly not. And just understand your limitations because you don't want to hurt your GPA, but you need to show us that you can take on that academic rigor as well. Um, Julie, what's the next question down? So, um, do admissions factor students into do admissions factor students grades by year? So, for example, does junior year hold more weight than freshman year? How do you look at you know what year a student did something? What their transcript looks like for each year? Um, so, for the UC system. Uh, we actually use what's called your UC GPA, and it's only based off of your sophomore and your junior year. Um, we will still see all your courses that you took ninth grade. We'll see your planned courses you have for senior year. But the actual GPA that is used for admission is only the sophomore and junior year. So we would say those are probably the two most important. Um, we also have a cap on how many um, advanced level courses or college courses students can receive that extra point for, which is eight. So um, we, we recommend students to kind of focus on those years. Of course, we still see your grades from sophomore or uh, ninth grade. We'll still see those classes. So, you know, we also will notice if a student has a bunch of rigorous classes and then all of a sudden senior year is just filled with PE classes, 
that can be a little of alarm to us, but otherwise um, those two middle years are gonna be the most important. At Quinnipiac, we look at uh, nine through 11. So it's one extra year uh, versus Taylor uh, at UC San Diego. Uh, but we are gonna ask for your first quarter grades, senior year, your mid-year grades, and we're gonna wanna see how you're progressing through your senior year as well. Um, so the, the nine through 11 years is just for the initial admissions review, right? So if you're, if you're admissible at that point, sure, by all means, we're gonna go ahead and, and admit you, but of course, we're gonna ask for your final transcript as well to see how you did in senior year. Um, but for those students that are on the fence, say we're kind of reevaluating, uh, we might do what we call defer a student, say we need to take a second look and see how you're performing your senior year. And that's why you all want to make sure that, you know, you're staying on your toes and keeping your grades up senior year. And then the last thing I always like to uh, add in terms of this question is just simply upward trend or consistency. Those are the two things that I always like to uh, let students and families know about. Either you're struggling initially, maybe adjusting to the high school level, but we see the, your grades consistently go upward as you move through your sophomore and junior year and then even in your senior year. But you know, consistency is just as solid as well. So if you're a consistent student and performing well, we'd love to see that as also. I would say the same thing for Providence College. We do look at ninth, 10th and 11th grade we do look for your progression. And that being said, um, just kind of um, piggybacking off of Quinnipiac, um, if you know that you struggled a lot in your junior year, you might want to consider a regular decision cycle when you do have your mid-year grades that you can show that you can do the work with confidence. Um, so I would, I would just say kind of analyze, you know, talk to your counselor and kind of see where you are to help you find the appropriate cycle for you based on if you are on that steady progression up or maybe you took a little bit of a junior year dip to kind of undecide where you're when you're going to apply. Um, thank you guys. So other than courses and grades, what makes an applicant stand out for your school? I would say passion. There are there are there are a couple of applicants where um, their passion for a particular topic or specific just bounces off the pages. So maybe they're not the strongest academically, but you can just really see their um, excitement for that um, particular academia area, and that comes through. So um, if you do have a particular passion, certainly shine that in your application. I mean, everyone's talked about internships you know, um, research opportunities, you know, if you have those available to you, certainly um, show those um, or different extracurriculars, um, but be able to, to show that your passion for a particular subject. And um, uh, the other thing that I would say as an applicant, you, you know, we, uh, we talked about a little bit about different admission cycles. And I think um, Tim said it best, you know, do not apply ED unless you are bleeding that school's colors you know, because there is that agreement. And, um, and I think that nothing breaks your heart more than anything else is you, you've committed to a school and then you haven't talked finances with your family, you haven't um, gone through that full um, consideration of how this may impact um, your overall um, possibilities. And if, and if you are financially shopping, as we like to call it, do not apply ED, you know. Um, so you can be passionate for school and not apply ED. So just, just remember that as well. Yeah, I would say there's probably three categories aside from the set of criteria that, that was mentioned with grades and test scores. You know, when we get to the level of digging into essays and looking at letters of recommendation, you, know, you want, you're looking, I look for three different types of students. One who's just you know, really well-rounded, has taken advantage of a lot of things, you know, that you could see is easily going to assimilate into our campus and be an involved member of the community, right? So then a lot of extracurricular and community service and clubs and organizations and so forth. And maybe the grades have suffered a little bit, but you know that they, you know, they're well-rounded. And another student, you know, that I, I especially have an affinity for are those students who have overcome adversity, you know, who have, uh, you know, faced hard times, they've shown resiliency and grit, 
and have those characteristics that I feel like, you know, maybe if we took a chance on them, they've got what it takes to get out of here with a degree and not a fistful of debt, but a degree, right? And then the third category are, you know, let's be honest, you know, not everyone has had extraordinary adversity in their lives. And I certainly don't want you to make it up, you know? So those students who can exercise a degree of humility, like, you know, hey, yeah, it was kind of goofball. You know, I, I realize it now. I, I, you know, I want to make amends if given an opportunity, you know, and if I am a bubble kid that, you know, I feel like, you know, I, I could really make a go of it at your institution. And it's a, it's a good fit for me for X, Y, and Z, you know, th those, that's the third category of students where, you know, what, again, when I'm digging into those, those other elements, of the application, you know, I, 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 those stories resonate with me too. Thank you. So um, the next question is due to COVID, um, Will colleges be offering extra help programs over the summer for students who don't feel prepared for college yet? You know, one of the things that um, our orientation and new student programs and transitions team has really been talking about is, is kind of the multifaceted elements of a student's transition this year. There are a lot of students who haven't been in school even five days a week, let alone hardly at all, like Boston Public Schools just returned to school this week in person for some period of the time. So I think there's there's a lot of very different experiences students have had. And so not only is it the academic preparation, but it's the social preparation, um, kind of getting back into that, a setting where you're surrounded by a lot of other students. It's already a lot of anxiety in a new place, a new setting, but having now been at home or in a very small bubble, kind of transitioning into that setting. So I think there's a lot of knowns and unknowns. I think the good news is we, all of our campuses have staff and student staff who are very going to be prepared and ready to assist students through orientation, through new student programs, through kind of those first few weeks, especially on campus. They, they are ready for that type of dynamic. And I think they're ready to face a very different um, kind of experience than they had in previous years how that will play out is kind of tough to know. Um, and so I think that they're prepared for all kinds of scenarios, both students who will need additional assistance academically, um, you know, faculty and you know, other graduate students who support classes will be prepared for that, but then also counseling and, you know, services and other resources our campuses provide will be ready for that as well. One, one of the nice things about the pandemic is that everyone has a lot of skill now in virtually advising and counseling and in person. So students don't have to necessarily physically go somewhere maybe to get some assistance or guidance. They might be able to sign up for a virtual appointment or they might be able to talk to someone in that way. And I think that's a great advantage in this, this kind of hybrid situation we're entering into. So I think that that's one of the things higher education does really well is has a lot of very experienced staff and student support systems. And I think that those will be utilized now more than ever, both academically and kind of on a personal level. Um, but yeah, that's one of those tough, tough unknowns, how that will actually play out this fall. But I think we're ready, we're ready for it or we're acknowledging that that's the case. I, I'm sure a piece of advice I'm sharing with my son actually this year, who, as I said, is a senior uh, and feels like, you know, this year especially, he just, you know, he hasn't really gotten the analytical. Uh, you know, math course under his belt to the extent that he felt like he would like to have had. I mean, he's doing his, you know, senior math, you know, remotely and so forth. Um, but, you know, to gain some of that confidence that he can do college level analytical work, I'm, we're actually going to enroll him in a community college course this summer. And, uh, you know, so that he gets experience and confidence of doing college level analytical work. And at the same time, you know, we're on the Cape, it's like $600 for three credits. Uh, it's probably the best deal you'll find. Um, and he can transfer those credits along at the, uh, he's gonna attend an out-of-state public university uh, in spite of my best efforts to get him to go to Bridgewater. Uh, didn't wanna go where dad works. Um, so, <laughs> so he'll be able to transfer those three credits. You know, so regardless of the school where you think you might enroll, you know, look to some local options too to help provide your own summer bridge program of sorts. Uh, and, and it's not a bad thing to pick up those three transferable credits and carry them along with you as well. Um, I just wanted to just take a couple more questions. Um, I did see we had a hand raise. I didn't know, Colleen, if you had a question. Um, 
uh, looks like not anymore. Okay. Um, so the, the one of the last questions, and we get this a lot with, um, again, going back to choosing courses is if a student, is it better for a student to take a class like an honors math class and get an A versus a B in an AP class? What would you recommend for a situation like that? An A in the AP, um, but that was not the question. Uh, so obviously, I mean, every, every student's gonna be different and their talent and their, uh, their strengths. Um, so uh, do take a curriculum that is challenging, but also manageable for you. Uh, don't take classes that you think um, that you have to take in order to get an X, Y, and Z college, um, because it's gonna make for a miserable senior year. Um, if you don't think you can handle that level of rigor or that course load. So um, do what is, is right for you um, and your level rather than jumping into uh, deep water that you can't be swimming in, so. I would also add, I think that question can be tricky just because it really is a case by case basis. Um, you know, if you have a student who maybe hasn't taken a lot of APs, it might be beneficial for them to choose the AP over the honors, but maybe you you have had a good a number of APs and you think maybe I can get a better grade in the honors. Um, I think it also depends on just how the school utilizes um, AP versus honor as well. So like for us, for example, you're going to get an additional point regardless for that, um, add it to your GPA. So I would say pick what you think um, you can perform better in. But again, if you maybe don't have a lot of APs, it might be better to just go ahead and choose the AP so you can show that we you are taking that extra rigorous coursework. Um, and this will be, um, there are still some questions that are really um, college specific. So we would encourage um, any attendee whose question didn't get answered to reach out directly to the admissions reps or to your guidance counsel at your school and we can help you answer those questions for the sake of time. Um, the last question uh, we get a lot is, is there a benefit to applying early decision, early action or regular admission um, when applying to school? Do you get kind of a leg up if you apply early? Um, and uh, that will be the last question for today. I think Tim kind of mentioned it earlier on, um, but it, it, so I, I was traveling one fall and I met a student who said, I'm really interested in applying early decision. I just don't know where yet. That is kind of like saying, I'm really interested in getting married. I just don't know to whom yet. Um, so for early decision, the binding version, um, for early decision, it is um, if you are 99% sure about a school, then actually don't apply early decision to that institution. If you are 100, like Tim said, 150, 200, 500% sure, then yes, definitely apply early decision. Um, but again, like Trisha mentioned before, if you are worried about financial aid, um, if you had a bad uh, junior year and you need to show first semester grades or senior year to uh, show improvement, um, then again, early decision may not be the right choice for you. Um, so again, it, it all depends on uh, how comfortable you are and if you've done your research and that's if you know that that's where you wanna be for the next four years. Yeah, I, that, just to reiterate, reiterate Daryl said it perfectly again, uh, as usual, he's been nailing them tonight. Uh, but uh, just so you know, you know, if you're applying to a non-competitive major, but say you're not really uh, confident in your performance from grades nine through 11, right? You wanna perform well in your senior year and you can hold off a little while, right? So hold off to early action, regular decision, whatever each university or college may offer you in terms of the application process. But I did mention earlier, again, in addition to what uh, Daryl had said, certain majors you're applying to, you may need to apply a certain way. So that is something that you must research. And for an, another, uh, for example, again, just to reiterate again, what I said, nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, physician assistant, these programs at Quinnipiac, you must apply early action. You do not have a choice. So you are going to put yourself at a little bit of a disadvantage if you don't apply early action one. Uh, so that's something to pay attention to. You know, if, uh, again, if you're waiting on your strong senior year grades and it's a non-competitive major, you're not gonna hurt your chances 
uh, at Quinnipiac University. It's just something that you're going to, again, you're going to need to look on an individual university and college uh, case by case basis in terms of what schools you're interested in and what the best way to apply is. But early decision for sure, you need to be 250% sure that that's the place for you because you are committing to a university before you get your financial aid offer, before you even find out what scholarship amount you're offered. Uh, so that that's really important. You need to be uh, confident that that's the place that you're going to end up and nothing's going to hold you back from attending there. If you're considering UMass Amherst and you're attending a panel like this, you absolutely should be working toward applying early action. We have a higher admit rate for students who apply early action. Um, it's about half of our applicants coming through early action and the other half coming through regular decision. And if you're especially looking at some of the more competitive majors, computer science, nursing, any of our business related majors, most science majors or STEM fields, you should absolutely consider applying early action. Um, because we do have a higher admit rate in EA than we do in RD for many of those majors. So definitely keep that in mind. And that deadline is November 5th um, each year for early action. The Providence College, the higher admit rate is ED, but at the same time, fewer applications. So you have to um, kind of look at it in that perspective. I will say early action is probably the most competitive at Providence College. Um, and that's because it is where our strongest candidates apply. It's when they choose to apply. And so many times a student will get admit, deny, or defer. If a student is deferred into the regular decision pool, it doesn't mean we don't like you. It means we need to see more. We need to see maybe senior year grades or something to that extent. I will say at Providence College, if you reach out to us, and uh, you choose to have an interview with us and you show us your transcript, we can actually say, okay, your best chance of admission is going to be this particular pool. We will actually advise you on which pool you should go into. And we will we'll be very honest with you as to why that would be. So for example, you had a rough junior year, you should have some of your grades consider regular decision. So um, we're happy to do that and, and to, um, to let students know their best chances of admission. At Bridgewater, we have uh, early action, we have a regular decision, and we use the same admission standards in either case. Uh, if we see a higher admit rate in, in early action, it's because those students are more organized, probably doing better in school and so forth, and, and meet the qualifications at a, at a higher rate. The advantage to early action for us is that you get to know sooner. You know, the early action deadline is November 15th, um, you know, to submit the application, transcripts and test scores, essays and so forth can arrive later. So the advantage is you get to know whether you're admitted or not, probably around Thanksgiving. And in all likelihood, if you file for, uh, for financial aid, you'll have your award letter before Christmas or the holidays, in which case, what a great position to be in, right? You, you get your admission letter and your award letter and you can sit back and wait five months for everyone else to catch up. Um, so there are a lot of advantages for the student. Obviously advantages for us as an institution because we get a sense of what our applicant pool is like that much earlier. About 40% of our students apply now in early action. But you know, after that priority deadline, February 15th, and then after that, you know, rolling admission until the class is full. So, you know, we try to get decisions out as quickly as applicants uh, complete their, their packets. You know, so turnaround time is about two weeks. And for me, it's about options. It's about having as much information as you can to make the best decision for you and for your family. So my advice is always, you know, if possible, apply sooner rather than later. You probably hear it sooner rather than later. Be less anxious going into the back half of your senior year, which is a nice place to be. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us tonight um, and also, you know, taking the time. I know that it's uh, difficult in the evening with families and dinner and everything. So thank you all for joining us. A special thanks to all of our panelists for joining and helping us out and answering all of our questions. Um, again, for the questions that weren't answered, and if you have even questions you think of after you hang up, um, please reach out to your guidance counselor at your high school or the admissions reps. Um, we're always very happy to help and answer questions. So thank you all. And um, I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. Bye. Thanks. Good luck, everyone. Thank you.